Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, we're going way down the rabbit hole here, right? We're really, really get, getting deep into chaos theory and trying to understand it from the perspective of mathematics. So we've defined chaos, we've looked at its defining components like positive Lyapunov exponents, we've looked at period three implies chaos, in the previous lecture, we looked at the Baker's map and we got introduced to the first strange attractor that we've actually been able to quantify and write down what it looks like. And now what I would like to do is talk about another one of those fundamental properties of a chaotic system, the dimension of the strange attractor. And in particular, we're going to approach this from one of many measures of, the, uh, of an attractor and that is called the box counting dimension. Now this is one of the oldest and best used and, and longest studied examples of, an, of a dimension or a measure of dimension, but there are many others, right? There is a Hausdorff dimension uh, that we are not going to talk about. I just want to explain to you sort of how I could say, for example, that something has dimension 2.16, which I believe is the case for the, uh, for the Lorenz equation. Another famous example that you've probably heard of if you came into this lecture series with any knowledge is, you know, the, the fractal coastline of, the, of Britain and people trying to figure out what the dimension of its very complicated Coke snowflake looking uh, coastline is. So I'm going to walk you through the fundamentals today. And again, like a lot of things in chaos theory, this is very much a computational process. This is something that should be done on the computer, or at least guided by computation. Remember, dynamical systems is one of these few areas of math that came into being parallel with modern computing, right? And so a lot of it is sort of developed in such a way that we can complement it, or even just use computers to give us these answers. Now, of course, I'm gonna give you all of the math today, and I would like to see if you could implement it. So I am going to be interested in what's called the box dimension or the box counting dimension, okay? So this is a standard measure of a fractal dimension. And so what we say is that for a set, I'll call it S, which belongs to Rn, we let N of epsilon be the number, the number of boxes of uh, side length epsilon, epsilon greater than zero, that S intersects. Another way to say this is, how many boxes do you need to cover the set S? And so essentially what this leads to is this leads to sort of taking a grid of your, say, your medium. In my case, of course, it's gonna to be two-dimensional because that's what I'm sort of reduced to drawing here. So you sort of break these into epsilon by epsilon boxes. And for example, you could have a line inside of this, right? Or maybe you've got a more complicated two-dimensional shape. Right, so this is maybe my two-dimensional shape, and you can see that it's intersecting a lot of boxes here. And what I could do is I could introduce what's called the box dimension, dim B, box dimension, of a set S to be the limit as epsilon goes to zero of the logarithm of n epsilon divided by the logarithm of, uh, sorry, one over epsilon, pardon me, one over epsilon. And that's only if the limit exists. Now, okay, where does this actually come from? Well, it comes from the sort of intuition that a one dimensional object should intersect like one over epsilon, okay? So the number of boxes that are intersect of course, as epsilon gets smaller, you intersect more and more boxes. And the scaling that you should observe here is one over epsilon, right? So that gives you one over epsilon, one over epsilon, these things cancel to give you a dimension of one. Similarly, 
For a two-dimensional object, this thing should scale like one over epsilon squared, okay? So again, one over epsilon squared, the, the square comes out, you get a two in here for a two-dimensional object. And in general, for standard, you know, objects, squares, cubes, you know, hypercubes, all of these kind of standard objects that we're all used to, their box counting dimension lines up with the dimension that you understand that they have, okay? But the nice thing about this is that you don't have to do this just for things with integer dimensions, right? This limit doesn't always have to give you a nice integer. It could have a scaling law that's say three over two or pi, right? That is sort of what we're seeking out here. We're, we're, this, this limit right here uh, is sort of looking for a scaling coefficient. How does the number of boxes grow as epsilon gets smaller? That's the question here. And these power law scalings are exactly what we're looking for. So let's do an example, okay? And we're gonna do interesting examples, not just squares and lines. Let's do the, the Baker map attractor. Baker's map attractor. Okay, so this was from the previous video. This was zero one cross a Cantor set. Remember, it's the Cantor middle third set. So the question is, what is uh, the dimension of the attractor here? Well, first of all, this is in two dimensions and this is a line, zero to one, right? That's a line segment. So that thing has dimension one. So that means that we just need to figure out what the dimension of C is, right? that will really sort of determine this. So let's look at this for a second. Remember that C is equal to the intersection of all of these, these middle third sets, which I called CN. So you might have to reference the previous video to see the iterative procedure that brought me up to these. And each CN is equal to two to the N intervals, intervals of length, one over three to the n. So, essentially, if we let our epsilon, so let's say, again, we just want this limit to exist. So let's say, what if epsilon was one over three to the n? Again, we want epsilon to go to zero. One over three to the n goes to zero, okay? But that means that the number of intervals of length one over three to the n that I need to cover each cn is two to the n, right? So this tells me, this tells me that um, my box counting dimension of c should be this limit. The limit, so again, it's as epsilon goes to zero of ln of n of epsilon, divided by ln of one over epsilon, which again, this is really sort of the limit as n goes to infinity. Now you're sort of thinking about this cn, the limit of these things. So with an epsilon of one over three to the n, I can cover all two to the n intervals here. So this gives me ln of two to the n divided by ln of one over one over three to the n. Remember, epsilon is one over three to the n, which a little bit of fun manipulation with logarithms, but this gives you ln of two divided by ln of three, which is something like 0 0.631. So what does that mean? This thing right here, the attractor, the box counting dimension of the attractor for the Baker's map is about 1.631. One is coming from the one dimension in X and the 0 0.631 is coming from the, the dimension of my Cantor set, ln, over, uh, ln of two divided by ln of three. So there it is, we found our first non-integer set, right? So here, all we did was use the formula for the box counting dimension, and we applied it to 
this Cantor set that we looked at in the previous video. Let's look at another example here, okay? So let's consider this set. The set of one over every natural number along with its limit, zero. Okay, so one thing that you might think about is, I mean, this is like a, a set of discrete particles, right? In fact, it's a countable set, right? It's just that it's the number of integers, or sorry, the number of uh, natural numbers, right? It's a very, very simple set. It's pretty small by most metrics. So, so maybe your intuition would be that this thing is kind of zero dimensional, right? It's just a bunch of collection, or it's a big collection of points. Well, let's actually see this for a second, okay? Let's pick k greater than or equal to one. And then we can cover, remember we're always talking about covering with this n of epsilon. So we can, we can cover the interval zero to one over k um, with k plus one intervals. of length, and I'm, here's why I'm gonna choose an epsilon. Epsilon is equal to one over k minus one over k plus one, which is just one over k times k plus one. Now, okay, you're probably thinking, you know, Jason, where did you get that? That doesn't really, you know, when I first saw this, it took me a long time to sort of think it out. Uh, so let's actually take a look at the number line here. Try and visualize this set. So the first point is at one, then the next one is at a half. Uh, let's put it up here. And then the next one is at uh, a third, and you know so on and so forth. And let's say one over k is right here. Here's one over k plus one. And then this, the length of this interval right here, this is, 1 over k minus 1 over k plus 1, which is equal to 1 over k times k plus 1. And you can repeat that k plus 1 times to cover this entire interval from 0 to 1 over k. Okay, So there's uh, k boxes of length epsilon, or sorry, k plus 1 boxes of length epsilon that cover this interval. But there's also points missing, right? So we need, we need another, and it's, in this case, it's going to be k minus 1 uh, such intervals. I'll show you where this comes from in a second. Um, to cover the remaining k minus 1 uh, elements. to the right of one over K. Now, what is it that I'm talking about? It's a little halo that goes around this one, a little halo that goes around this one, a little halo that goes around this one, right? So I just put a little tiny ball around each one of these to cover them up, right? So these are my, my discrete points that are left over that are outside of this interval. So I need a, a little interval to hover over each one of those in, either, in order to um, in order to cover them too. So hence, let's look at the box counting dimension here. Box counting dimension of my set, well, this is, okay, so I'm going to take the limit as k goes to infinity, that's the same as epsilon going to zero, right? And the number of boxes I have is k plus one, from this first part, and then plus another k minus one from the second part, and then divided by ln of one over epsilon, which is one over k times k plus one. Okay, you can have a little bit of fun with this. Let me show you. This ends up being uh, ln 
sorry, the limit as k goes to infinity of ln of 2k, that's easy, the ones just cancel, divided by ln of k squared plus k. Now, simplifying this limit is actually, it's a pretty easy task. You can do it in a bunch of different ways. You can use L'Hopital's rule if you want. You can use properties of logarithms. You can factor around some k's. All kinds of fun things to do. Here's what I'm going to tell you. It's equal to one half. Maybe you can challenge yourself and work through that, okay? But what does that mean? This like discrete collection of points has a dimension in this weird way of thinking about things. And actually, its dimension is a half. Now, one thing that people do sometimes is they confuse dimension and like a measure or the length of something, right? This is not saying that a half of the points between zero and one belong to S. This is a very abstract way of generalizing the dimension of something. And in this case, you know, the number that gets spit out is one half. In the same way that my Cantor set, which was uncountable, perfect, you know, totally disconnected, closed, bounded, all kinds of these important properties, this thing has a dimension of 0 0.631. So whenever somebody talks about chaotic systems and they talk about, you know, the dimension of something being 1.234, this is what they're typically talking about. They're talking about this box counting dimension. And really, this is just a way for us to quantify whether or not something is a fractal, right? So we say that things that don't have an integer dimension are fractals. Right? So there are lots of different and sort of uh, competing ways to think about fractals, but this is one way to quantify it analytically. So in this case, we would say this set is a fractal. In this set, case, we would say this set is a fractal. We would not say a line or a square are fractals because they have integer box dimensions. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed this lecture series. This is the final lecture in this series. Now, I will continue to talk about dynamical systems on this channel, so be on the lookout. But this marks the completion of our introductory course on dynamical systems. So congratulations, you made it. I hope you had as much fun as I did, and I hope to see you again uh, in my next videos. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye.